Welcome back. This is Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, continuing where I left off, the sea chest. I lost no time. This is chapter four, I apologize. Chapter four, the sea chest. I lost no time, of course, in telling my mother all that I knew, and perhaps should have told her long before. And we saw ourselves at once in a difficult and dangerous position. Some of the man's money, if he had any, were certainly due to us. But it was not likely that our captain's shipmates, above all the two specimens seen by me, Black Dog and the Blind Beggar, would be inclined to give up their booty in payment of the dead man's debts. The captain's order to mount at once and ride for Dr. Livesey would have left my mother alone and unprotected, which was not to be thought of. Indeed, it seemed impossible for either of us to remain much longer in the house. The fall of coals in the kitchen grate, the very ticking of the clock, filled us with alarms. The neighborhood, to our ears, seemed haunted by approaching footsteps. And what between the dead body of the captain on the parlor floor and the thought of that detestable blind beggar hovering near at hand and ready to return, there were moments when, as the saying goes, I jumped in my skin for terror. Something must be speedily be resolved upon, and it occurred to us at last to go forth together and seek help in the neighboring hamlet. No sooner than done, bareheaded as we were, we ran out at once in the gathering evening and the frosty fog. The hamlet lay not many hundred yards away, though out of view on the other side of the next cove, and what greatly encouraged me, it was in an opposite direction from that whence the blind man had made his appearance and withered, he had presumably, presum, presumably returned. We were not many minutes on the road, though we sometimes stopped to lay hold of each other and hearken, but there were no unusual sound nothing but the low wash of the ripple and the croaking of the inmates of the wood. It was already candlelight when we reached the hamlet, and I shall never forget how much I was cheered to see the yellow shine in doors and windows, but that, as it proved the, work, the best of the help we were likely to get in that quarter. For you would have thought men would have been ashamed of themselves. No soul would consent to return with us to the Admiral Benbow. The more we told of our troubles, the more man, woman, and child. They clung to the shelter of their houses. The name of the captain, Flint, though it was strange to me, was well enough known to some there and carried a great weight of terror. Some of the men who had been to field work on the far side of the Admiral Benbow remembered besides to have several have seen several strangers on the road and taking them to be smugglers to have bolted away and one at last had seen a little lugger in what we call kit hole for that matter anyone who was a comrade of the captain's was enough to frighten them to death and the short and the long of the matter was that while we could get several who were willing enough to ride to Dr. Livesey, which laid in another direction. Not one would, would help us to defend the inn. They say cowardice is infectious. But then argument is, on the other hand, a greater emboldener. And so, when each had said his say, my mother made them a speech. She would not, she declared, lose money that belonged to her fatherless boy, if none of the rest of you dare, she said, Jim and I dare. Back we will go, the way we came, and small thanks to you big, hulking, chicken-hearted men. We'll have the chest open, if we die for it, and I'll thank you for that bag, Miss Crossley, to bring back our lawful money in. Of course, I said, it would go with my mother, and of course they all cried out at our full heartiness. But even then, not a man would go along with us. All they would do 
was to give me a loaded pistol lest we were attacked, and to promise to have horses ready saddled in case we were pursued on our return, while one lad was to ride forward to the doctors in search of armed assistance. My heart was beating finally when we set forth in the cold night upon this dangerous venture. A full moon was beginning to rise and peered redly through the upper edges of the fog, and this increased our haste, for it was plain before we came forth again that all would be as bright as day, and our departure exposed the eyes of any watchers. We slipped along the hedges, noiseless and swift, nor did we see our or hear anything to increase our terrors, till, to our relief, the door of the Admiral Benbow had closed behind us. I slipped the bolt at once, and we stood and panted for a moment in the dark, alone in the house with the dead captain's body. Then my mother got a candle in the bar, and holding each other's hand, we advanced into the parlor. He laid as we had left him, on his back, with his eyes open and one arm stretched out. Draw down the blind, Jim, whispered my mother. They might come and watch outside. And now, said she when I had done so, we have to get the key off that. And who's to touch it? I should like to know. And she gave a kind of sob as she said the words. I went down on my knees at once. On the floor, close to his hand, there was a little round of paper, blackened on the one side. I could not doubt that this was the black spot. And taking it up, I found written on the other side, in a very good, clear hand, this short message. You have till ten tonight. He had till ten, mother said. I, and just as I said it, our old clock began striking. This sudden noise startled us shockingly, but the news was good, for it was only six. Now, Jim, she said, that key. I felt in his pockets, one after another, a few small coins, a thimble, and some thread, and big needles, a piece of pigtail tobacco bitten away at the end, his gully with the crooked handle, a pocket compass, and a tinder box, where all that they contain, I began to despair. Perhaps it's around his neck, suggested my mother. Overcoming a strong repugnance, I tore open his shirt at the neck, and there, sure enough, hanging to a bit of tarry string, which I cut with his own gully, we found the key. At this triumph, we were filled with hope and hurried upstairs without delay to the little room where he had slept so long and where his box had st stood since the day of his arrival. It was like any other seaman's chest on the outside, the initial B. Burned on the top of it with a hot iron and the corners somewhat smashed and broken as by long, rough usage. Give me the key, said my mother and though the lock was still very stiff, she had turned it and thrown back the lid in a twinkling. A strong smell of tobacco and tar rose from the interior, but nothing was to be seen on the top except a suit of very good clothes, carefully brushed and folded. They had never been worn, my mother said. Under that, the miscellanean began. A quandrant, a tin connecting, several sticks of tobacco, two brace of very handsome pistols, a piece of bar silver, an old Spanish watch, and some other trinkets of little value and mostly of foreign make, a pair of compasses mounted with brass, and five or six curious West Indian shells. I have often wondered since why he should have carried about these shells with him in his wandering guilty and hunted life. In the meantime, we had found nothing of any value but the silver and the trinkets, and neither of these were in our way. Underneath there was an old black, old boat cloak, whitened with sea salt, of many a harbor bar. My mother pulled it up with impatience, and there lay before us the last things in his chest, a bundle tied up in oilcloth, and looking like papers, and a canvas bag that gave forth a touch the jingle of gold. So I'm going to leave off there. And I hope you subscribe and put your comments down there below. And uh, thank you for following along.